Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron, live interactive Bible study. We're a leader led by Pastor Douglas Banks out of Columbia, Maryland, and our facilitator is Minister Brenda Robb from Northern California. We're currently studying the book of Revelation. Come on in, have a seat, and study with us. Thank you so much. Uh, as I was getting on the line, I heard someone singing, and the Lord mm. put a song on my heart as well. Um, uh, oh, my goodness. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Of my job. Uh, that's all I'm going to sing because <laughs> I had planned <laughs> on doing that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I thank the Lord. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for rising us up once again this morning, Father God. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us each the health and the strength that we have, Father God. I thank you, Lord God, for bringing us all together on one accord, Heavenly Father, that we may hear and know the truth about your word, Heavenly Father, that we may understand, Father God, that we may take bite-sized chunks, Lord God, and chew it and digest and get it down in us, Heavenly Father, as the man of God feeds us, Heavenly Father, with your word, as you have put it on his heart, Father God, to instruct us, Father, for a time such as this. But we were all called together right now for a time such as this, Heavenly Father. And we thank you and we praise you for allowing us to be able to do this, Lord God. We don't have to run and hide, Father God. We don't have to duck and dodge, Lord God. We can be out in the open with our faith, and we can praise you, Heavenly Father, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, Father God. We can share the good news, the good news, the good news of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Lord God, and we thank you for the man of God as you have pressed it upon his heart, Father God, to teach us, to lead us, to guide us, to prepare a feast for us, Father God, that we may sit and suck together, Father God. And we thank you for Minister Brenda, Heavenly Father, for you know her labor of love as she lovingly facilitates this life each and every day. Father, and I thank you for each and every person and household represented on this line this morning, Father God, as we come into your house with praise and thanksgiving. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Doug. Amen. And amen again. We thank God for yet another day to lift up his name, another day to call on the power of God within us. Uh, to bless others according to the witness of his word. Um, and I love that this morning. Oh, how you walk with me. Oh, how you talk with me and tell me that I am thine own. And therefore, therefore, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Amen. Giving God praise this morning to each and every one that has decided to come out and, and join us as we dig down into the treasure of God's word. Uh, we're going to start today uh, right out of the box uh, on page nine of our workbook. We've already gone over the human author of this book of Revelation. The human author that the angel gave it to is John the Revelator. John the Revelator uh, wrote according to the witness of God's Holy Spirit. So we've gone over the author. We've gone over the application the application is that we read, that we hear, that we keep this word, and we will receive the sevenfold blessing of God. The sevenfold blessing of God is his very presence, his very presence among us, his, his power within us, uh, Kratos power, the Bible calls it, and dunamis power, Kratos from the inside and dunamis from the outside. The sevenfold blessing of God will be with us. His presence will give us wisdom and understanding. His presence will give us counsel and might. His presence will give us knowledge and fear of the Lord uh, to prepare us and keep us uh, completely blessed so that we may be blessings one to another and to all others. And so we've gone through the author, we've gone through the application, and now we're going to take a look at the bottom of uh, 
on page 9, at the approach, because there are four uh, standard approaches in the world. These, uh, there are probably a few more, but these four have been accepted as the basic four ways to approach the book of Revelation. And so you have these four groups, these four denominations, uh, or these four interpretations, because there are so much symbols, there are so many visualizations, there are so many uh, out-of-earth interpretations that these four ways of looking uh, and interpreting the book of Revelation have been uh, prophesied. And so uh, we'll look at them uh, this morning. And so under the approach in your workbook at the bottom of page nine, under the approach, uh, the first one is called the preterist approach in interpreting the book of Revelation. The preterist approach is from the Latin meaning the thing that is past. In other words, preterists believe that everything uh, in the book of Revelation has already happened, has already been fulfilled in the distant past. And that is the view of of, of people. These same people say that the gifts of the Holy Ghost are no longer possible because they were given to the the, uh, uh, disciples, the the apostles, and to them only. So we don't have the gifts of God um, uh, because it's all in the past. And when they view the book of Revelation, they, they carry that over and say that the events, uh, the view teaches the events of this book have all been fulfilled in the distant uh, past, and that the book of Revelation has literary value, but not real value. There is no uh, real uh, eva- uh, value to it for us. They consider that in the first and second century, they look at Nero. They consider Nero being the Antichrist, uh, and, and, and so he was the one that stood against Christianity and tortured us and maimed us and, and fought against the church. Uh, the problem with this book is that uh, from chapter, uh, I'm sorry, the problem with this interpretation of the book is that from chapter four on, which we will get into, none of these things have happened at all. Uh, they say that everything has happened in the past, but when we get to uh, four, chapter 4 on, we will find out that none of these things have happened and that Revelation is actually a prophecy and not just a nice literary book to read. Okay, so that's the preterist approach. There are hundreds of thousands of people who believe this. This is their approach. Okay, and then secondly, we have the allegorical approach. Uh, symbolic or idealistic. This view regards all the visions as an allegory of the age-old conflict between good and evil. It teaches neither historical nor future events are specifically portrayed. In other words, there's no reality here. It's just an allegory, uh, an allegory which is a story or a poem that reveals a hidden meaning, uh, typically a moral or political one. So they, uh, the allegorical approach teaches us that we ought to read the book of Revelation the same way we might read uh, Beauty and the Beast, the same way we might read Moby Dick, the same way we might read Sleeping Beauty or George Orwell's 1984. Just a nice story, a good, enchanting, and tremendous story, uh, but there is no actual events, no truthful uh, visionary events that we can take from it which to me is a direct affront to the word of God because the book of Revelation is the word of God. But these people consider it uh, a long allegory um, and uh, or a mystical book. It's a mystical book that has no true reality that affects us. That's their approach to the book of Revelation. The third uh, approach to reading the book of Revelation, go to page 10, the top of page 10, is called the historical approach. There are those, uh, uh, this approach teaches that the predictions cover the entire period between John's day and the return of Christ. This view sees the visions as symbols of the rise of the papacy, the corruption of the church, 
and various wars throughout history. In other words, the historical approach says that the book of Revelation is about uh, the earth as we go through uh, historically, as we go through various things, the rise of the papacy. For those who don't know, there were there were popes in the past that used to fight each other. There was a pope in Italy, a pope in Rome, and a pope in England, and they all had armies, and they fought each other to determine who was the real pope. Uh, Italy won, and, and so the pope became uh, the pope in Rome. And, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, then, then they go on to talk about the corruption of the church here, and there was corruption in the church historically, where the Catholic Church would sell indulgences, which are basically get out of hell free cards. You can live any way you want to, give the church this amount of money, and we'll get you out of hell. They, they sold simony uh, packs, uh, patrimony. My, my son will take over my cardinalship. You want to be a priest? Uh, you want to be uh, a cardinal? Give me this amount of money, and you could be one. So they were selling uh, things of the church. And so we have seen corruption in the church and then, of course, the uh, various wars throughout history. This historical approach teaches that um, Revelation sort of comments on the early persecutions of the church, the barbarian invasions that happened in Europe, the dark ages in Europe, the medieval time period in Europe where there was darkness over the continent, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, even the American Revolution, World War I, World War II, the Vietnam War, the, all of these wars, they said, and all this pestilence and disease that hap has happened historically is what Revelation is talking about. The problem with this, again, is that after chapter 4 in the book of Revelation, the things that are, are said in, in, that, uh, in those pages have not happened yet. They have not happened at all. And so you cannot, if you believe it's the word of God, if you don't believe it's the word of God, like the allegorical approach, you just believe it's a nice story, then you can accept what the historians say. But if you believe it's the word of God, then you have to reject this uh, approach to the book of Revelation because from chapter 4 we will see many of the things listed have not happened yet in the earth. And so the idea is you either believe it's prophecy, the word of God, or you don't. The, uh, the fourth approach to studying the book of Revelation is called the futuristic approach. Uh, and this view interprets all the events from chapter 4 on as future happenings. Uh, this is a more literal approach, interpreting the judgments described in chapters 6 and 8 and 9 and 16 as literal future events expressed in symbolic terms. We'll give you it's symbolic, but they are events that will happen. No events in history have even come close to these things. Uh, for example, when the first of four trumpets is blown, hail and fire mingled with blood are thrown down on the earth. And the question is, as a result, what happens? But before we answer that, let's go on and read Revelation chapter 8. If someone would read that for us, Revelation chapter 8, if you would read verses 6 through 13. Revelation 8. 6 through 13, please. This is Gloria, and I can read Revelations 8, 6 through 13. And it reads, Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared the sound to sound them, the first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurtled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burnt up. A third of the trees were burnt up, and all the green grass were burnt up. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea was turned 
into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the water turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, and that so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. As I watched, a third, uh, I heard a, the, an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels, the word of God. Amen. 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 Thank you. So this is the word of God, and these things have not happened yet in the earth. And this is only a small example of the things you will discover in the book of Revelation that have not taken place. Uh, And we who follow the futuristic approach believe that these things will happen. We believe this is the word of God and that these things uh, will happen. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the Old Testament prophets, Daniel, in Daniel 9, 24, 27, talks about it. Uh, Daniel 12, 1 and 4 talks about it. Jeremiah talks about it in chapter 30. And then even in the New Testament, Jesus himself talks about it in Matthew 24 and 25. And so the only uh, one of these approaches that agree with the word of God and can be backed up by the word of God is the futuristic approach. Okay, so uh, back to 10, the middle of 10, it says those who object to the futuristic approach charge that the book of Revelation would not have been a comfort to its original readers if it is largely futuristic. They think it from a worldly perspective. However, immediate application of distant events that reveal the ultimate victory of righteousness has been a source of comfort from the time of Old Testament prophets to believers today. We believed in prophecy from the Old Testament on, so there's no reason to think that this one book of prophecy in the New Testament is different. Therefore, in this study, we will use the futuristic approach. We will use the approach that is supported biblically, the approach that is supported by the word, of God. Any questions or comments or concerns about the approach we will use? Hi, this is Sister Evelyn. I, I, I was listening, but what is the answer as a result of what happens? I have trees, me? trees and grass burnt up. I didn't hear the answer to number four. The answer to number four is, as, uh, is uh, from Revelation chapter 8 and 7, D and F. D and yes. F, is, is, it says it there, Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, D and F. So yes. verse 7 uh, tells us that the first angel sounded, hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And so D and F would tell us that the third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. And so if you can see green grass, you know that this hasn't happened yet. And if you know that uh, trees still exist and a third of the trees on the entire earth are not gone, then you know that this hasn't happened yet. So to answer your question directly uh, is, and a third of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. Uh, 
Okay, so do you have that? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, we're going to use the futuristic approach, one, because it's supported by the Bible, um, and also because common sense tells us that the things we will be reading about in Revelation have not happened, and we don't consider it a story like Beauty and the Beast or Moby Dick. We consider it a prophecy of God. Okay, so back to uh, 10. Um, The second paragraph at the bottom says that regardless of the approach followed in interpreting this book. Pastor Banks, this is Mary. Please, I want to ask you. Good Uh morning. Um, morning. These initials behind, like chapter 8, verses 7, D and F, what is D and F? What does that mean? I don't have that in my Bible. Yes, you do. You just don't know what it is. Um, This, uh, (laughs) when you... When you look at a verse, right? When you look at a verse, let's go. Let's go there to uh, where? What is it? It's uh, at eight, chapter eight and verse seven. Let's go there, chapter eight and verse seven. Yeah. Okay. If if we read the first angel sounded and hail and fire followed mingled with blood, that would be seven a. That would be the first idea represented in the in verse seven. Right, uh, yeah. and, and they were thrown to the earth, and that would be B. So that so you would just go actually C D. You you take an idea, first idea is A, second idea is B, third idea is C. You break up the verse, and that's called uh, exegesis. And we talked about that earlier. Ex- As you begin to exegete a verse, you recognize the. Uh, the ideas within that verse, and you begin to break it down. So there's a 7A, there's a 7B, there's a 7C, there's a 7D. You just go down the line. Um, oh, I don't break know it up that verse. Yeah, you I just see. break down the verse, the ideas in the verse. Mm-hmm. And that's all it is. And you could do that with any verse. When, when you, see, um, you see something uh, telling you, okay, go to verse 26B. That means disregard the first sentence or the first idea and look for the middle of the verse and see what it says. And that's what you put in your workbook. If it says go to 7C, you look, to, you know, two-thirds down, and you look for that sentence. In this case, it says D and F. I don't know how we got to F, uh, but I would say uh, E. I wouldn't skip E, 7D, and the third of the trees were burnt up. That would be D for me. Uh, and then what he calls F, I would call it E, and all green grass was burnt up. That would be the next one. So, and the third of the trees were burnt up. That's one idea. That would be D, uh, and all green grass was burnt up. And for me, that would be E. So you would take those last two sentences, those last two ideas, and answer mm-hmm. the question with them. Okay. Okay. Also, I've also uh, ran into uh, parentheses. They would have, like, say, um, one chapter one for. for um, uh, anyway, it had M K at the end of the um, chapter. What does that mean in parentheses? M K. That's uh, that's uh, an original writing. You're going to see that L L. MK, you are you gonna see or if it's maybe the Gospel of Mark, I'd have to see what you're looking at. But you're gonna see a lot of the ancient writings. Uh they will they will say, okay, reference to the ancient writings, it might be that. It might be letting you know which volume to go to. Uh so it might be that or it just might be the book of Mark. I'd have to see it. All right. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, I think, I we're thank at you 10. very much for asking that because um, that was something that I needed to know too. Thank you so very much. Yeah, you're Amen. Welcome. And that's why it's good to ask questions. So we we help ourselves and we help others. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay. So May any I? other questions? Yes. With all the fires. Now, I know you're saying clearly that one-third of the uh, 
at one time we we will lose one third of the of the green the forest. But I understand that the rainforest is being attacked just as much as we're looking at California with the with the um, forest fires, with the type of changing we're having in our climate control. So with that said, are we looking at a pre preview of what it can look like? I don't think so. <laughs> Mm. It'll be worse than that. No, it ain't worse. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't. I think he lost you. Hold on. Oh, hello. Yeah, I was on mute there. Um, yeah, Adrian, I I agree. And I think that we are living in a time period that the Bible calls the time of sorrows. The time of sorrows is the beginning of these things. They're setting up for the tribulation. We're not in tribulation yet, but we are in the time of sorrows where we can sneak a peek. We can see what it's going to look like as we get just a touch, as we just get a, 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 a pandemic, as we just get outrageous fires in California as we just get two hurricanes that, that attack uh, the Louisiana and, and more hurricanes than we've ever seen in one year uh, coming into the United States. And all of these calamities that are just beginning, they're just beginning, but when they really reach their peak in the time of tribulation, it will be horrendous, absolutely horrendous. This is just a touch of what will happen in the tribulation period. Mm. You can't okay. run fast enough now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. You're going to find out in the book of Revelation that it says people will try to hide in caves. They'll go under rocks. They will be uh, asking for death, and death won't come. It's, 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 uh, I, I, I'd rather choose Jesus. As the old folks used to say, ain't no hiding place down here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so we, we believe in this futuristic approach. We believe the events are still in the future, uh, and it will come during the seven-year tribulation period that Daniel calls the 70th week, and that's in Daniel 9 and 27. We believe the rapture will occur, that the Antichrist will be revealed. He will become a world leader. Uh, according to what I read in the Bible, he will come out of Europe. He will unite ten kingdoms, um, and he will be a world leader, and God will pour out judgments upon the earth, which will culminate in the destruction of Antichrist and his armies at Armageddon. Uh, and this will be at the revelation of Christ. Uh, and at the end of the seven years, um, that Jesus will set up his kingdom, his millennial kingdom on earth. So that's the, the summary of how the book of Revelation proceeds with the futuristic approach. Okay, so uh, in the middle of 10, your workbook, page 10, the one, two, third paragraph, starting with those. Those who object to the futuristic approach charge that the book of Revelation would not have been a comfort to its original leaders if it is largely futuristic. However, immediate application of distant events that reveal the ultimate victory of righteousness has been a source of comfort from the time of Old Testament prophets to believers today. In other words, when Isaiah uh, prophesied the coming of the Messiah, when David prophesied uh, the coming of the Messiah, we, it brought comfort to those who read it, and so there's no uh, reason to think any differently about the book of Revelation. Therefore, in this study, we will use a futuristic approach. Uh, and that was the question. Does anybody have a problem with using the futuristic approach as we study the book of Revelation? No, uh, no, because it makes it makes perfect sense 
the other two approaches to me <laughs> don't make it. <laughs> no, they um, don't depend on trusting the word of God. They don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's again but, man taught in his own wisdom and his own understanding. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So regardless of the approach followed in interpreting this book, all of the visions and symbols cannot be fully explained or understood. We won't understand everything, but we will get an idea of what God is doing. In Daniel chapter 12, which also deals with the end of time as we know it, we can discover why some of the prophecies cannot be understood now. And so why, according to what an angel tells Daniel in 12.9c. So what do you have there for Daniel 12.9c? This is Cynthia, and it says, An angel tells Daniel because the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the Lord. Is why we can't understand yes. everything? Amen. Um, okay. And so just for, uh, for Mary's question, let's look at 9C. And it would be, okay, uh, just as an example, an A would be in nine, in, in chapter in verse nine, twelve and nine, and he said, "Go your way, Daniel." Would be like A, nine A, for the words are closed up. Would be nine B, uh, so closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Would be nine C. So it's just breaking down the verse, and that's all it is. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so we close at the bottom with the uh, the map of the seven churches, which we will be getting into shortly uh, to get the most from this study. Remember the author, remember the application, and remember the approach. Okay, and our approach will be the futuristic approach. And the map at the bottom shows Patmos. You see Patmos, a little island, off from the coast of what is today called Turkey, off from that coast um, is the island of Patmos. That's where John is. And after Domitian was murdered by a plot hatched by his wife, um, and uh, Tejan took over as emperor, John was able to leave this island of Patmos, come back to Ephesus, uh, the church that he went to, and began to disseminate the book of Revelation, what we call the book of Revelation to the seven churches. He went clockwise from Ephesus to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. He disseminated the word of God. So uh, Domitian thought that he would take John's influence away, quiet him up, shut him down in the Christian community. And what actually happened was that John saw the revelation of Jesus Christ and brought a powerful uh, uncovering, revealing of God back to the churches. Okay, then let's go to 11, page 11 in your workbook. And that takes us to lesson two. Lesson two, when life is tough, Revelation 1, 4 through 20. Uh, Lesson number two, I'm going to ask someone to read for us Revelation 1, verses 4 through 11. 4 through 11, please. This is King Reverend Harris. I'm reading. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Karen. Uh, 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 Revelation 4 through... Revelation chapter I'm... 1. Uh-huh. Verses 4 through 11. 4 through 11, thank you. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him 
which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and with every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so. Amen. Eight. Jesus is speaking. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice of trumpet. trumpet. 11. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Amen, the word of God. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Okay, so John is given his mission. Um, what do you see? The Lord has told, uh, well, he, he said who he was. He said again, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I was, is, and will be again. And he gives John uh, the mission to write to the seven churches, to send letters to the seven churches about the condition of those seven churches. Yes, he, he's sending this to the seven churches and to all churches eventually, right? But it's going to start mm-hmm. with the seven churches. Uh, and so we see Jesus identifying himself. So we know exactly who he is. He came as a, a sacrificial lamb, but now he's telling us that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. That is all things. Colossians 1 tells us he is all things, and by him all things were made. And then mm-hmm. I want to focus on what he said. He says, I am he who is, who was, and who is to come. And that means what? That means Yahweh. Yahweh. I am that I am. Right? I, I encompass all of time. I was, I, I am, and I will be. I am. I am that I am. So he is declaring who he is. Yahweh is the name given to Moses. Yahweh is the personal name, uh, the, the personal relationship that we have been allowed to have with God. To some people... God is Elohim, the original name. Elohim, uh, he is God. But, that, but God separate from me. God in the distance. God in the universe. God covering everything. Uh, but when God said that he was Yahweh, he became the God who was with us. He became the God who has allowed mm-hmm. us to commune with him. He became personally God to us. So the, I am, the, uh, I am, I was, and I will be is Yahweh. I am that I am. And then Jesus says, the Almighty. So he is, remember that Jesus, the name Jesus, uh, means Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves. That's what the name Jesus means. So he came as the salvation. God saves. I am that I am. And then he says he is the Almighty, which is El Shaddai. He is El Shaddai. He is the Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega. He is El Shaddai, the Almighty. I am that I am, and I am the Almighty. So he's identifying who he is. 
Okay, what else do we have in these uh, verses? Hello, this is Sister Adrienne. I, I think uh, along that same line you were saying the completion, how he wrote seven letters, which is which represents the completeness to reach the entire world, just as he used the 12 disciples to spread, to teach the 12 disciples to teach the rest of the world. Absolutely, Adrian. And what we are going to find out is that these seven churches, the, I mean, there were all kinds of other churches in, in uh, Jerusalem, in Troas, in Corinth. There were all kinds of other churches the reason these seven churches were chosen is that each one of these churches represents the church that will exist throughout time. There will be a church. Wherever you find a church, it's going to be like one of those seven, and we're going to get into those seven. It is, it is perfection. Seven is the number of perfection and completion. And so these churches represent all the churches that will come to be in the future. The church you go to now is like one of these seven churches. And not mm-hmm. only that, every Christian is like one of these seven churches. You're going to find mm-hmm. out which one you're like, and you're going to find out which church represents your church, which is the closest to your church as we look at these seven churches. Uh, um, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, this is Minister Brenda. I'm going back to verse number nine. When I look at what John said to himself, he identifies himself as both their brother and their companion. And he said, in tribulation and in the kingdom, in the patience of Jesus Christ. So he's telling them that, them that he's going through, he knows what they're going through, and that there's going to be more suffering. So he's letting them know there's things that are going to be happening, is what I saw. So the test Things are going through. to be happening, and they're going to be uh, terrible, yes. Right. Um, and he comes mm-hmm. back as their brother, yes, as mm-hmm. companion. Right, and he tells them yes. for the testimony of Jesus Christ is why he's there. So he's explaining that as well to them. And they would have understood that, you know. He's trying, to me in that, he's trying to give them some comfort right now in that to me. Amen. He is. He is. And they know, you're right, they know that uh, Domitian banished him uh, because he spoke boldly for the Lord. Uh, And if he wasn't fearful, he would have just killed him. But he was a little fearful because John had juice. By this time, John has a lot of juice. Uh, And so he he didn't want to actually kill him. He wanted Patmos to kill him. It didn't work out that way. Okay. I want to draw your attention to verse 7. Verse 7. It says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. Now let's stop there at B, at 7B. He's coming with clouds, A, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. Now, who pierced him? The the Roman Roman. cross. At the cross of Calvary, right? Right. At the cross of Calvary, he was pierced with what they call the divinity spear, the holy spear, that pierced him in his right side, and water and blood gushed out of his side. So at this time, uh, Jesus has been resurrected. He's uh, taught the apostles. He's gone back to heaven. All kinds, this is hundreds of years after this Roman soldier pierced him in the side. So we're talking hundreds of years later, but Jesus says, every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. So that means the dead is going to see him too, right? Right. right. Yes. Everybody will yes. see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes mm-hmm. of the earth will mourn because of him. Those who rejected him as the Messiah and did not agree that he was who he said he was. So it's, it's the living and the dead are going to see him, even they who pierced him. Everyone will see him when he cracks the sky. 
and takes up unto himself his own. Hmm. Okay, anything wow. else before we move? So, Pastor, All right. this yes. This is, so that supports the scripture where it says, for the Lord himself shall descend from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So this is letting us know the other people will rise also. That confirms that to me. Yes, okay. absolutely. Absolutely. Everyone will get an opportunity. You either go with Christ or you won't. And if you don't, there will be tribulation such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world. Okay, if somebody would read uh, uh, verses 12 through 20, please. 12 through 20. It's Reverend Harris. I'll read it. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as it refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in, strength, in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he, said, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys to Hades and to death, of death. Write these things which you have seen, and the things which are and things which will take place after this. 20. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Word of God. Amen. Amen. And so we will start there tomorrow. We will go over uh, this, uh, the end of uh, chapter one. We'll go over that on tomorrow. And so we pray, Lord God, that you continue to touch our hearts to receive the words of Jesus Christ, that we might receive wisdom and understanding uh, uh, so we may walk in the light of your love. Uh, Bless us, Lord God, as we continue to delve into what you have written for us to know who you are and what shall happen as we go forth in this future that you have determined already will be according to the word of God and the witness of his power. In Jesus' name, we give thanks, praise, glory, and honor to him who was willing to die and who is yet able to live forever. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.